<laughs> Get settled in here. I got a different different chair and it's like feels funny. Always a and danger. Here we are. Good morning, everybody. And good evening to those of you in points east. Here we are with uh, the 87th part of What is Truth? I'm John Barnwell. I'm here north of the city of Detroit, the Straits. And I'm here with the Reverend David William Perry in London, England, merry old England. And so here we are going to try and elaborate on our approach to truth and it's an ever ever never ending quest until you arrive at the realm of manas where truth is self evident how are you doing there david i thought you'd do that um we are having a heat wave in uh, you don't have any sound Oh, 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 on my end. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Um, yeah, we're, we're having a heat wave in what was once known as Merry Old England. Yeah. Um, I'm incredibly pale. Uh, I, that's not said as a, as a sort of ethnic one upmanship. It means I feel the heat more than everybody else. Um, and the purity of my genes mean my joints are susceptible. <laughs> um, both knees have gone, they're in agony. Both elbows have gone. Um, lovely summer weather, but I'm beginning to realise uh, it. I've got to be so careful nowadays. I am coming up to 64. I know you beat me, but I'm coming up to 64 this year. And if global warming is true, I think there's something to it, um, then I've got to think, OK, is this really how I want to spend my summers from now on, which it isn't. Um, the, the good news, I suppose, is... We've had some political turbulence over the last couple of days, which I have found absolutely hilarious. But this isn't the show to go into that, sadly. Um, all I'll say is, uh, you know, is the intelligence level dropping along with the attention level uh, in, in modern society? The person who caused the disruption has been saying exactly the same thing for over 20 years. Why wasn't anybody listening? He's been saying exactly, I will do this, I will do that, and you will go along with it for over 20 years. And oh, it's all come as a shock. It's all come as a shock. But how? You know, doesn't anybody listen to anything anymore? You know, oh, oh, you know, the person, oh, bit of a laugh, bit of a laugh. You know, are you listening to what he's saying? Um, anyway, so that happened. Um, I'm also under a se severe pollen attack at the moment. John? You might brief people on who it is you're referring to. As I'm frightened to do that. have our faces glued to the BBC. Right, I'm frightened to do that. Mine has been glued to the BBC the last couple of days. Uh, our serving Prime Minister, Boris, you're not the head of state, love. That's the Queen. That's the Queen. Okay. Um, has been uh, forced to resign because he's a pig's ear. There we are. Um, people got sick of the endless lies, the court cases, police involvement, breakings of the ministerial code, open misleadings of parliament, which, by the way, anyone else would have instantly resigned about. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the catalogue of misdemeanours, where he was now surrounding himself with people under investigation for sex offences. I mean, one of his top team is being investigated for rape. How much lower can things actually get in this country? Um, so, yes, he, he's not taking any blame himself, as is typical of that character. Everyone's out to get him, as they say in Carry On Cleo, infamy, infamy, they've all got it in for me. Can't beat that as a gag. That's one of the best ones. Um, so he grudgingly was forced by the party chairman to bite the bullet. Um, never used the word resign once in his resignation, which, of course, isn't a resignation. 
because he's actually caretaker prime minister until the Tory party has a new leader. And the new leader is forced upon us de facto as the prime minister until there's an, another election. Um, does that, I mean, I, I've never taken personal dislike to any British politician before now, but the, the, the celebration, hi Paulie, the celebration um, of misdemeanours by that man is absolutely unbelievable. I mean, you've got sort of backbenchers and middle benchers in the Tory party itself openly criticising him during parliamentary debates, you realise something is deeply wrong. Um, anyway, he says he's going, unless he starts a war, of course, to keep office, which I wouldn't put past him. And uh, there's that, that bit of good news. Um, Was so, it, weren't, you, weren't you the guy that said you weren't going to go <laughs> in that direction? Boy, yeah, I, I, pulled, I pulled your trigger. <laughs> I'm trying not to, John. I'm trying not to. Do you know, uh, apparently the French Gnostics are not going to recognize my ministry because I've got political activism in my CV as well. I assume that maybe 40 years ago, well, I'll be generous, maybe 30 years ago. But, you know, I assume nowadays they mean posting the odd meme on Facebook <laughs> because they can't cut with my knees. They can't mean much else. Um, yeah, uh, they, should, they should call it face up book. I, I've no faith in any of these social. I'm on a huge poison pen letter called social media, <laughs> um, where everybody's always in the wrong and everybody needs to be attacked. I mean, it's all a real indictment of our society. And I thought him as prime minister, and then I'll, I'll change the subject, was the actual last straw because that's the embodiment of everything that's wrong. Um, Right, let me balance that by saying old old, old Tories, um, I'm not a Tory, I'm not Labour, I'm a Libertarian. Uh, the old Tories at least I can understand. You know, I don't agree with them, but the landed gentry, the landowners, <clears throat> they had a sense of noblesse oblige. They had a sense that God, had, you know, the angels had put them in those positions to, to look after the people uh, under their care. But I can understand that. Um, and I can sort of, I can sort of respect that. I mean, it's not modern; it, it, it's obsolete. But I can understand what they're saying. These new Tories that know nothing and care about nothing and, and revel in that—that that is a complete mystery. I don't know where that's come from, but I know where it should go. Uh, and he's the worst example of the worst. Um, so as I don't know. I just hope, you know, I don't know. Whoever gets the job, I just hope it's not Michael Go. <coughs> Um, who is the most pathetic yes man until he's actually given permission to say something? Then he's then he's worrying. But yeah, so that's happened in Britain. What else? Let me think. Um, rehearsals for the the grammar of witchcraft start tomorrow. Um, so and yeah, we're having we're having a, a mixed blessing of a time. I wish it was merry old England still. I'm not sure it is. I wish it was. I wish that would make a comeback. I wish the reenchantment of these isles could take place um, and that it could be the land of Shakespeare and lovers once again. Wouldn't that be lovely? Um, and, you know, we we could get back to serious Scottish scholarship and uh, English love poetry and all those wonderful things that gave this country a delightful reputation, which sadly, it's if it's not long since lost, it's paling into insignificance. How about yourself, John? Any UFOs coming to cheer you up? That's an interesting question. Well, you know, I mean, in the words of uh, Sylvia Tejans, played by Rebecca Hall on the BBC HBO co-production of Parades End by Ford Maddox Ford, she says, higher than the beasts, lower than the angels, stuck in our idiot Eden. <laughs> And so there you have a, a somewhat uh, interesting slam on, on how much fun it is to be one of those elite characters <laughs> where she finally reaches the rope's end. And uh, so you can get caught up in all that kind of drama. And, and really, if you, if you look more closely, 
at Boris, he's an unusual. I mean, his father was uh, Stanley Johnson, who believed the population of the UK should be reduced around 75%. And he wrote two novels, uh, The Marburg Virus in 1982 and The Virus in 2015. And by the way, his paternal great-grandfather was Ali Kamal Bey, who was one of the last interior ministries of the Ottoman Empire government, and he was assassinated in 1922 during the Turkish War of Independence. So yes, is Boris bad enough? I mean, I'm, I'm just sitting here waiting with bated breath to see who they replace him with. That'll be more cooperative according to uh, what's coming out of the Privy Council. But let's not talk about politics. It's far more interesting to talk about the thoughts of, of some of the more illustrious individuals who are illustrious through their achievement rather than birth. But uh, I sent you, David, a uh, PDF recently, uh, and it was an interesting lecture by Rudolf Steiner in Dornach of December 4, 1920. It's in the series Universal Spirituality and Human Physicality, and it's lecture three, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Thought, Will. And in there, Rudolf Steiner says, in his philosophy, Hegel speaks of thought, but actually means cosmic thought. He says, whenever we look in the outer world, whether we see a planet in its orbit, an animal, a plant, or a mineral, we are see, really seeing thoughts everywhere. It is just that these kinds of thought in the external world exist there in a different form than they do in our thinking. It cannot be said that Hegel sought to propound an esoteric theory about the thoughts at work in the world. However, it remained esoteric since few people read his works. It was not his intention to propound an esoteric doctrine about the world's cosmic content, but it is extremely interesting that the secret societies of the West regard the idea that the world is really formed of thoughts as a profoundly esoteric doctrine. Things which Hegel naively and openly stated about the world are viewed by Western Anglo-American secret societies as the content of their secret doctrine, and they believe that this secret should not be popularized. And so there you have it. It's uh, interesting. And since David's one of the few people I know will have some inkling of the battle between Schopenhauer and Hegel. <laughs> and Schopenhauer was very impolite, shall we say, in, in, the, in the diatribes that he created against Hegel. It drove him crazy. Uh, of course, then you get Schopenhauer later in life turning to the East to resolution of his concepts of, of monism. But uh, it's, it's really not monism in the East. It's non-dual. And there, there's a, a world of difference that, that more closely approximates Hegel than Schopenhauer. So that's what I have to say. I mean, curiously, I do have a bit of an insight into that, that debacle. Um, <clears throat> for, for me, I suppose it comes down to the argument between Christianity and non-Christianity. Um, I'm a huge admirer of Schopenhauer. I mean, I think anyone that listens to this show regularly knows knows that I'm basically Hegel's love child. Um, you know, I mean, because all I do is go back to him and start quoting him again. Um, and, you know, there's something sublime in the phenomenology of spirit. Also, his politics is deeply misunderstood. You know, elements of the philosophy of right needs to be read in the context of the time. I mean, that clearly makes him a liberal <clears throat> in the context of that time. It doesn't make him a right winger, whatever that means, you know, in the context of that time. <clears throat> so Hegel is this sort of... Um, enigmatic brooding sort of professorial figure the ultimate school teacher 
you know, in, in his endless clothing and fox furs and you know, giving people F grades because he's in that sort of mood. I mean, you know, and they deserve it because he was a good scholar. Um, yeah, I mean, there's something deeply Protestant and Lutheran, whether he admits it or not, in that type of writing and that type of mysticism, dare I say. Uh, you have to really be blind to miss the mysticism in Hegel's work. And it's not just in the phenomenology, it's all the way through in various forms. Um, I think that's exactly what got up Schopenhauer's note. Um, and as I say, I've a huge admiration for Arthur. Arthur went to school in Wimbledon, just down the road from me, which people don't tend to remember. Um, I had a learned, I, I helped an undergraduate with an essay many years ago and said he went to school in Wimbledon. It's all in the documents. And to which the learned professor who was marking him said, oh, did Schopenhauer ever come to England? Yes, professor, you need to look it up. Um, so he went and basically he didn't like what he saw. Um, he didn't like Church of England because he thought they were too optimistic. He wanted to embrace the tragedy of human existence, uh, which he saw as tragic in the sense that it could never be fulfilled. Our condition could never be fulfilled. It could never be redeemed in any meaningful sense because he rejected Christianity. And um, certainly I agree with you 100% that he turns towards the East. <clears throat> I mean, people need to remember that myst Hindu myst uh, mystical Hinduism, Buddhism is only really being translated for the first time in that particular era. And it's, you know, trickling into Europe. And it certainly seems to be the case that he had a copy of the Upanishads and maybe uh, even uh, uh, you know, the Lotus Sutra. I think that's under discussion. Uh, copies by his bedside and he saw it in his own words as a vindication that the fact you know these eastern boys had arrived at exactly the same set of conclusions that's not entirely the case as you said but you know it was a vindication of what he would have described as the Kantian Schopenhauerian enterprise the Kantian Schopenhauerian philosophical view and that basically this this huge raft of Indo-Germanic cultures had suddenly been unified in a, in a single vision. Uh, one of the most interesting things, which he hardly mentions, curiously, is that he says, for me, is that he says Christianity could have been taught very, very differently, um, by which I assume he means that our good Lord could have been presented like an ascetic, uh, like a sannyasin, uh, rejecting the illusions of the world and surrendering to higher states of enlightenment, which is, of course, possible. And certain of the early Christian mystics did do that. Uh, some of them paid for it with their lives. Um, some did not. They just paid for it with obscurity. Um, but, you know, the, for me, those two philosophers, they sort of balance each other. They're, they're opposite sides of the same equation. You know, what is the human condition? What are its limits? What are its boundaries? Uh, is there anything outside that condition that can raise us up into a fulfillment? of our condition. So Hegel must say yes as a good Lutheran. Schopenhauer must say no as at the very least a sceptic. And maybe, I mean, he wasn't an atheist. You know, if, if he, he didn't believe in the Judeo-Christian God, but anyone that reads his writings very quickly comes across the fact there's something going on. You know, this glittering numinosity beneath all things. That's interesting. And, you know, that's another way of talking about the divine. Um, and he never denied that type of intuition, but he didn't like the anthropomorphism of, of Christianity. He clearly disliked that it wasn't to his taste, and he felt it was too optimistic and far too people-centred. I mean, I hate reducing major thinkers to sound bites. You know, the, the trouble with the human condition for Schopenhauer is that we live in an inhuman universe. It's not evil. It's not toxic. It's not poisoned. He's not, uh, uh, as certain people have said, the philosopher of pessimism. That's simply not true. Uh, you know, basically, the, the, the universe isn't here for human convenience. We're not here and telling it what to do. You know, we are part of the overall structure, a tiny part. And what it's doing is what it's doing. And it's much more interested at the danger of anthropomorphizing in doing what it's doing anyway, which doesn't really include us much. 
Um, and that's where the human condition falls down uh, uh, for Schopenhauer. And you are left really with the, the insights of India and the asceticism of India and so on. You know, I don't believe when he said, you know, it was it would be better never to have been born. I think that's I think that's one of those sort of pregnant types of nihilism. You know, Schopenhauer likes having his back against the wall because he seems to have this opinion that if your back's against the wall, you've really got to search to find the truth. What do you really think? What is the truth in that set of circumstances? And that can only be applauded. And the fact he finds some type of vindication in the writings of the East, the deep, deep, deep writings of the East, can again only be applauded. But as I say, for me, we're looking at different sides of the same equation. And really, we've got to somehow get beyond both of them to take the next step, which is anthroposophy. I take that as a segue. Well, yeah, it's interesting because you can kind of connect the dots on things that you wouldn't expect. because. On the one hand, that kind of, I mean, admit it, uh, Schopenhauer really kind of threw his hands up in the air. You know, he, he had resigned himself to what he considered inevitable. And so he's really uh, a Calvinist at heart <laughs> that, that we don't even have a measure of, of control the way this story is going to play out is that it's just going to play out the way it plays out because the absolute is absolute and it and it's already absolutely aware of what's going to happen and there is that uh, tendency which is what you would call a, a luciferic bent uh, in in essence of the the pessimistic view of mankind and which is very interesting because through his embracing, you know, uh, passing with the copies of the uh, Upanishads on his bedstand when he died, you know. So you look at that, and with I'm with you. I go more with Jedu Krishnamurti, who died with a copy of Rudolf Steiner's The Philosophy of Freedom on his bedstand. So if you if you start looking at this more closely, you see. What do we have here? We have a an argument between two men of which most people on earth are, are oblivious, but yet have played a very influential role in in the mindset of the people that are running the show. And so it gets interesting, uh, Rudolf Steiner's comments about the Western Brotherhoods and their embracing of Hegel. And, and why is that? Well, when you get into looking at the whole uh, story about how in high technology, how how they actually view the world, what what the modern uh, physicists think that that most people aren't even aware of, they're still with whatever little bit of notes they could crib back in high school and college, and but you shouldn't assume that. Uh, that's because that's what they're teaching in, in those places, that that's what the people that are on the inside actually think. It's just like when you when you go to college and you pr appro approach a, a degree and you get your degree and then you go to the job to which it's slated and then they get there and then they teach you how to do the job because all that the college experience did was demonstrate to them that you're capable of following instructions. <laughs> So in that, in that uh, way of looking at it, it becomes a little bit different. But it, it goes, this goes back uh, to the story I've told on, on a few occasions, but I think it's been a year now. I should probably tell it again. But uh, when I went to my 20-year reunion, I ran into one of the brainiacs from my high school and glad to see him. I'd known him you know, since uh, third grade. And I said, so, uh, you know, what have you been doing? And he said, well, I've been working on secret projects for the government. And I said, oh, so you're working on a holographic model of the universe. And he got a shocked look on his face and said, 
I can't talk to you and walked away. <laughs> and so you know that they have some kind of holographic uh, modeling concept, but the, the problem with that view, it does tend towards the Hegelian view of the universe, but it has not made the movement from space into the realm of time. And so you have this very kind of AI-centered uh, spatial worldview that, that they're taking the Hegelian concept to, and you end up with this uh, uh, sequence of, of, of numbers as the, the understanding, just like I was seeing somebody earlier, it was yesterday, I believe, they were posting something on Rupert Sheldrake and uh, who's, who's very interesting. He's with his morphic fields and all of that, which is, uh, and I'm, I don't mean to sound condescending, but Rudolf Steiner would probably say, well, that's a pretty sophisticated uh, abstract worldview. And the difficulty is that it's attempting to use the abstract thinking as, as a, a means for solving the riddles of the living world it's it's just a very difficult concept because they it tends to want to take things and reduce them into uh, a mechanistic view, world view of which the highest example now is is uh, the ai system in fact if you look at the black rock for example they have tremendous assets you know uh, what 21 trillion dollars worth of assets that are being controlled by supercomputer and and making trades and largely coming in from the bond market so you with larry fink at their head so you look at this and you, and you see that the prices in real estate have been driven by one company and that they they drove the price down they bought up a lot of real estate and then they you know, uh, we're buying it above market value to drive the price up and only to be able to later on divest themselves. So you have this kind of mechanical world that we're living in that's, that's being uh, commandeered by uh, these digital subroutines, basically, which is, is kind of disturbing, but that kind of fits into Schopenhauer's view of looking at things more closely. And so I say, well, why would you say that? And I, I hearken back to what Rudolf Steiner said, that, that the Shiva principle represents the unredeemed uh, Lucifer. And like I've said on numerous occasions, when I die and I go to the threshold, I want to run into Jesus Christ and not Lucifer. And you could say that Lucifer is... is uh, in a certain sense, a leader of the, the, the hosts, the angelic hosts that don't have any faith in mankind being able to reach their goal at the end of earth evolution. And so in contra distinction to that, you have Michael, who's really the leader of the, the sun archangels and the uh, time spirit in which we're currently living and who has faith in mankind and their ability to be able to come to an understanding of the world through cosmic thought, of which you see here that Rudolf Steiner makes reference to Hegel attempting to come to terms with the concept of cosmic thought, which is very interesting because if you get into uh, the infrequent mentions by Rudolf Steiner of cosmic thought, you come to the ninth century where the Grail events took place and he talked about how it was at that time and the image of the grail uh, that it was being held above the model of salvation. And then it was brought down to earth in the ninth century uh, with the crowning of Parsifal as the grail king. And that, that Rudolf Steiner said that represents the uh, descent of cosmic thought into the human realm. Ooh, where do I begin with that? Uh, you know, there's something psychic between you and me today. I've been going on and on about Kelvin 
Um, oh, God, am I a frustrated Calvinist? Yes, employ me, Calvinism. Um, but today's his birthday. Oh, is it? Oh, my God. Um, major Protestant reformers I haven't made, made notes about enough. He's, he's had this weird influence on me for years. The predestination thing needs to be unpacked a lot more carefully. And I just love this. The, the idea of me in a ruffle, basically, and black and white gowns. I think that would suit me to the ground. Um, answering the Boris thing, um, I'm less worried about him not playing ball with the Privy Council because he couldn't play ball with anybody um, than I am the fact he's misleading the entire country, lying to the Queen, lying to Parliament and only paying £50 to the police for a drunken rebel during the lockdown, which he himself had imposed, whereas poor people living in the north had paid £10,000 as a fine and found themselves threatened with, with a jail sentence. The sooner that swine is gone, the better. They, you know, either the law applies to all of us or it doesn't. If you don't mean it, don't introduce the law. And that, for me, shows he's unfit for that position. Um, I'm sure the Privy Council can nobble whoever they want to. The fact he might be a bit hard going is neither here nor there. I'm sure they'll find some other dupe. Although, to be honest, since he's the slave of corporations in the first place, I find it very difficult to believe he'd put up much of a fight. Um, I've no time for the man at all because I know people who couldn't go to the funerals of their own relatives because of him. And he was at drinks dues in number 10. Uh, which is how seriously they took it all and how seriously they believed in the pandemic. Oh, well, hang on. I'm... Yeah, I've, I've heard that too. I've heard that too. But, you know, I mean, you've got to remember, apart from the so-called resignation, nobody really knows where it's going. I mean, that's typical British political fudging. So nobody, nobody, <laughs> nobody's any the wiser. Um, in terms of pessimism, I think it was Copleston, wasn't it, that said Schopenhauer was a pessimist. Um, and he said that because he was a, a Catholic priest, Jesuit, was he a Jesuit? Um, I don't see Schopenhauer as a pessimist. I do see him as a, a desperate idealist, not a philosophical idealist, a desperate humanitarian in a, in a world of pain and sorrow, uh, because that's how he would have seen himself, I think. Um, John? You could see him as the precursor of the existentialists, actually, I think. Oh, no, I, I agree uh, wholeheartedly. And uh, I'm, I'm some sort of existentialist myself, I think. One of these rare animals that's a Christian existentialist, they can exist. Um, it was reading Gabriel Marcel, um, who even Jean-Paul Sartre admitted was an existentialist. Um, you know, a Catholic layman, a brilliant, brilliant essay writer. Um, <laughs> excuse me, pollen attack, um, his plays are never put on uh, because, of course, Jean-Paul Sartre was eulogising the life and works of Jean Genet. I mean, the, the, the literary power of Jean Genet is beyond argument. But, you know, living as a thief and a male prostitute, is that really what we should be aiming for? And it was only Gabriel Marcel that wrote against that, not against Genet, against the fact that those the transgressive ideals. He did write against that. And there's one scene in one of his plays, I can't remember which one I found, excuse me, where the, the hostess is actually arguing with one of her guests who says, do you know, do you really, really believe that this is worthwhile? Do you really believe that? Yeah, the, and those were the questions not being asked in Paris at the time, which was under Jean-Paul's spell. Uh, and I don't write him off. Um, I do think he won't last as a philosopher. Um, he will last as a novelist and a playwright uh, because some of it is devastatingly clever and rather good. Um, as I say, the philosophy leaves, leaves a lot of questions. Um, whereas, yeah, I mean, what, what are these people in high positions saying that we don't know, we don't know? Uh, you might know because you've got contacts. I don't know because I don't know those contacts. Um, I do suspect, just finish this, John. I do suspect they want the mystical worldview hidden, which in itself is interesting. I mean, certainly the magical implications of string theory and the new physics can't be denied. So what are they actually saying outside of a classroom? I agree with that. And that is fascinating. Handing back, John. 
Well, I mean, I've always kind of looked on the existentialists as more literary figures than actual philosophers. You know, I I, I have a hard time uh, getting to that because there's a certain high bar that that is uh, demonstrated by specifically some of the British and German, especially. Uh, philosophers that they have have a certain seriousness about their equivocations that that uh, the whereas the existentialists they're almost coming from a position of Parisian smugness and so and that's why I see it more along the uh, Jory Suisman kind of worldview I think you know that, that it reminds me more of Labas. <laughs> Than, than anything else. It's like, well, why not? I mean, this is all we've got. Let's go for it, kind of kind of view with a little, but we're not going to enjoy it very much anyways. <laughs> so the, it's really kind of humorous you know, because of their lack of humor. And that's that whole statement uh, that I read from, from uh, Ford Maddox Ford and, and that when you get, and you look more closely at that statement, you see that here we have this, this uh, wealthy woman who's just really literally squirming within her, her situation, being married to somebody that she doesn't really care for and, and just living in the state of what you could call terminal ennui. <laughs> She's so bored she can't breathe. And and so that's kind of the end game of, of this this uh, a spiritual we can call it non spiritual uh, abstract realm, and uh, that's where you'll find uh, people that are embracing some of the thoughts uh, like uh, Harari, people like that. It's like uh, Gates and the whole the whole bug theory. <laughs> That we'd be better off reading books, you know, and that the grandfather of your soon-to-be former prime minister. What what is up with this whole idea that it, this would be a much better country club if there wasn't so many peasants crowding it up? And so there you get your your climate uh, theory. It's not even a theory. It's a staging. They all warn about climate change while they're buying mansions on oceanfront property. So if they thought that things were going to go awry, as they say, then the first thing to get flooded would be that mansion that they just bought. Now, actually, according to people that are really trying to work with science, it appears as though we have a much greater chance of going into uh, at least a minor ice age. And so, but yeah, there is temperature fluctuations in any cyclical activity. So it, that uh, it all becomes very interesting because everything is turned into commerce. And, and that's, that's, that's the rub. It's that, that whole seeking uh, within the world of the senses for fulfillment which is really inescapably retreating from you. The more you move towards it, the more it retreats. It can give you that sense of waiting for Godot. And that when is, when is the show going to begin? When is this all going to happen? And so you get uh, very sophisticated elaborations of field theories and all this mathematism, which has its value. I don't want to denigrate that. It's just that they never take the next step. The next step is that there's beings. And behind these ideas, there are beings. And it's if they can't conceive of that, that's not due to the lack of beings. It's due to the lack of their capacity to comprehend uh, the nature of beings. and. People want, always want to impose spatial uh, forms of uh, perception on the on the world. They expect like a, 
an angel up in a cloud to, to have a shape uh, like a human or something like that. They can't conceive of that it would exist in such a way so that it's very unclear where it began and something else uh, was blending in with them. So that it's, it's very evanescent, shall we say, is their, their appearance when they, they could dance around with the elemental beings as the waves crash on the shore at Tintagel, you know? So you have this whole idea of their inability to move in the realm of the living. And that's because they're attempting with, with sense-bound thinking, which we frequently discussed as describing the mirror image of reality rather than facing reality itself. And so, and I don't, again, mean to appear as if I'm talking down, I'm just trying in my own kind of uh, humble way to be able to frame certain concepts that can point towards what might be a better way to approach it. Actually, you never come across as someone who's talking down. I live in Britain. I know when people are talking down to me um, as a mere pleb myself. Um, oh, gosh. Oh. Yeah, I'm not getting into the whole global warming thing. I mean, it, it's hot here at the minute. That's all I can think of. Um, and, it's probably, and it just shows me I need to live in a more balanced environment. Um, which there'll be more about as the weeks unfold. Uh, the, the duration of this show is, is it, in itself burning with potential, so I think that's quite exciting too. That Harari guy, don't like him personally. Um, I don't think he's understood the existential. Um, I think, with the deepest respect, it's a little, a little off uh, to limit existentialism to the Parisians. You Frenchy swines, I know you'd love that, but I'm not having it. I mean, there were British existentialists too, and there were Spanish ones. And certainly it's not impossible to see types of existentialism as a via negativa towards the absolute. Um, you know, as I say, Gabriel Marcel, even Sartre admitted he was an existentialist and a Christian, a Christian ex existentialist which he would have said at one point couldn't have existed. And as a, a Catholic layman trying to explain the unfoldment of being by which you end up with things like revelation uh, uh, very, very quickly, you know, that's not to take his existentialism from him. Certainly in the UK, I mean, there are times when Iris Murdoch, her type of mysticism clearly goes in that direction. It's arguable, arguable that Bertrand Russell was actually introducing certain types of existentialism to British thought, British scholarly circles. I mean, I always have a mixed reaction to Bertrand Russell. Um, a very clever guy, you know, two Nobel Prizes, no underachiever. You know, his mum must have been proud. Uh, but you've got to you've got to balance that against the fact. You know, what are you trying to do, Bertie? You know. Are you trying to prove us all wrong? Or are you trying to prove that you're right about everything? Because that's not the same thing. You know, so what, what are you up to exactly? Um, and I always remember a, 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 an anecdote. I can't remember whereabouts in Wittgenstein it appears, where Bertrand Russell explained his uh, uh, very comfortable liberal middle-class humanism to Wittgenstein, uh, who replied he'd prefer to be bayoneted to death than actually agree with any of it, which, what a gutsy remark. What a, to your own professor, what a gutsy remark. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly in Wittgenstein, I think there are elements, him himself, there are elements of the existential in a mystical sense. You know, it's in the philosophical investigations where he, he says, you know, the most mystical fact in the world is the fact the world exists. Um, that is no trivial statement and the beginning possibly of a profound spiritual life. Um, I agree with you 100% that the Parisian scene was smug. In fact, if we didn't have a mixed audience, I'd go further than smug. Um, but smug will do. Um, 
But even then, I mean, you know, if we if you're looking at nausea, right, nausea, well, it made me sick for a start, you know. And uh, Roquita, the the anti-hero, you know, he's he's in a state of rebellion because the world is too perfect. You know, sod off and grow up. You know, my God, I wish I wish people starving to death in India or Africa could say something like that, you smug French bugger. You know, so no, 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 no. Um, but it still needs to be said. Uh, that's where we, we, we part company. Um, is it a realistic statement? You know, no, if you look at European culture and our values and all the things that have made us affluent and sustainable, at least until recently, compared with other parts of the world that are still trying to realise those processes, uh, no, it's just appalling. But it still needs to be said as a corrective to the unbridled optimism of the modernists who can't see a problem. And that is the type of thinking that's leading to an untrammeled AI. They can't see a problem. There is no problem because there is no other way of thinking. That's the real danger. Therefore, I rather like the smug sorts, you know, putting putting spanners in the network, putting spanners into the machine because it needs to be done. You know, where do I draw the line? I mean, you know, the, the fact he loved he loved the Germans until they end up losing wars. Yeah, you know, come on, you know, and the fact he liked Russia until they they started turning tyrannical. You know, no, no, no. But the, it needs being it needs to be said. It needs to be articulated, and people must debate, not just vegetate. I think that was the real power of what he was saying, and that needs to survive. I mean, I hate most of his plays uh, because they're too simple to put on. I mean, uh, in camera, right, three people shouting at each other for an hour and a half, right? You know, you've got to be a, a very good producer to make that entertaining. Uh, John. Or French to watch it. <laughs> no, 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 I know people think I hate the French. I don't. Make me a make me a, a cavalier of the French of French culture, and I'll be there like a shock. You know, and everyone I admire always moves to France the minute they make it, right? So bear me in mind, mon ami, bear me in mind. Um, but no, I and think our friends can... at, at Shakespeare and Company. I do actually. I do have friends at Shakespeare and Company, and they watch this show, and they watch this show. Um, um, uh, I can't think of it. You made me go completely quiet. Um, bonjour, uh, uh, Shakespeare and Company. Bonjour, I can't mon ami. <laughs> I'll stick with mon ami, exactly. Um, all right. Uh, so, no, I mean, sometimes I think we've got to be careful of throwing out the baby with the necessary criticism. Uh, because with all of his faults, with all of, with all of Bertie's faults, those things need saying. Otherwise, we're left with this cold rationality on the behalf of the modernists, and they still run the show at the moment um, with their endlessly cold view of human nature, which is merely the sum of its parts and can be engineered to be more effective. I mean, we've got to be very careful of that. We need little French pain in the arses to keep going to prevent that, to uh, to hold back an AI onslaught, which is just around the corner, if we're not careful. I mean, even Elon Musk, I believe, an American genius, is now saying we've got to be careful of all that. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've got to really look at where we're going at the moment. And the more dissension, the better, because it's not doing any harm, and it's only going around circles that need to hear a few home truths. Any thoughts, John? Oh, the sound is already on. Well, that's why I kind of brought in that quote from Sir Tom Stoppard's adaptation of Par Parade's End by Ford Maddox Ford. And he, he was an interesting individual in, in that he, uh, with uh, the people around him, uh, launched the English Review. That was a really influential literary magazine that published Thomas Hardy, Joseph Conrad, Ezra Pound, D.H. Lawrence, and all of these characters. And if you look at, he, he's a key individual in uh, the modernist movement in literature. So you have that whole uh, tendency. 
and it's interesting though that they kind of like once that they all became successful after being launched by him then they all kind of turned around and 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 smoked down on him as if he wasn't on their level so and there you have that kind of uh image of of what we see in pop culture that's a uh, if you can get a higher vantage point by standing on somebody else's head then good on you it's it's just it's uh it's pathological essentially the, and with good reason because it's incapable of solving certain mysteries in life that whole abstract brain thinking uh, can bring one to the resolution is that you think, well, this is all there is, so I might as well get as much as I can while I'm here attempting to enjoy it uh, in total disregard of anybody else. That's And that's the ultimate egoism and selfishness that needs to be overcome that leads down a, a luciferic path whereby you end up uh, longing for the cinder of earth because that which is of Christ will leave no remnants. It will be transformed utterly and completely into the new uh, level of evolution. And those that get left behind are left with that cast aside cinder, so to speak. And so it's, it, it becomes very interesting. And of course, you know, people will have other incarnations in the future where they could sort it out, you know, and hey, David, don't forget, you and I may have to reincarnate in Paris just to reconcile this difference. <laughs> Personally, I can't bloody wait. You know, oh my God, you know, was it Woody Allen? How would we survive all that French food? Please give me the chance. I would absolutely love that. Right, and I've got to say something about your holographic universe as well. Dear designers of the holographic universe, can I please lose a bit of weight in the holographic version of me? Because I'm finding it difficult at my age at the minute, and I'd be very grateful. Thank you. Oh, right, my turn. <laughs> or is it yours? Your turn. Oh, it really doesn't matter because I'm sure whatever happens will be uh, fun. And so, you know, the more we look at this and try to approach it and say, well, okay, where are we with all this? And, and going back, trying to, to, to weave it back into the central theme of, of this program is, is how the Grail Mysteries serve to provide a, a uh, receptacle to be able to hold uh, that world mystery that is, is the culmination of this whole idea of cosmic thought. And, and, and that's that spirit of openness. Is that it's okay to disagree with me. I I don't need you to agree with me. And in fact, Rudolf Steiner is very clear in that he he says uh, all he asks for is a healthy suspension of disbelief. And so, having that as as kind of a rudder in navigating uh, levels of thought, then you start getting into where you can actually examine ideas that you disagree and you'll get something out of it. Because all the, the 12 fundamental uh, philosophical views according to Rudolf Steiner have something to offer the world and there are unique insights that can be gleaned through contemplating their worldview. But that there's a 13th uh, worldview that's above the 12 worldviews that are arrayed in space. And that's that Christ vantage point, that allowing uh, things to come to fruition. That's the whole idea of understanding that there is seed before there is stock and leaf and blossom. And so you don't know where they've been. You don't know where uh, they're going to end up. Mind you, you could, you could end up uh, reincarnating uh, in northern Alaska. And, and in fact, the Russians are saying they want it back. <laughs> so, you know, there's all kinds of drama going on. And it's based largely on the confrontational nature of abstract thinking that we haven't gotten close enough to the sixth period in which people are more concerned for the well-being of others than for themselves. 
And so we have this glorification of egoism and, and selfishness that we're seeing uh, just arrayed on the world in an unbelievable caricature. And so that's, that's troubling very at the very least when you start to see that there's been more than 97 uh, fires and so forth at, at food facilities. And, and that's a lot, 97. So I I fail to to think that that could be an accident, and then when you have people like uh, Gates and 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 characters like that buying up farmland, what are they going to do with the farmland? Are they going to stop growing food, or you know what what's up with that? So we don't know. So we have these people that that don't embrace the the heart doctor, and they have managed to grab the reins of power. And so there's a total disregard of, of uh, genuine humanness, which is what is implied in, in the views of spiritual science, that the anthroposophia is uh, the art of becoming human. And so in that same token, we have to be able to feel compassion for these people. What what a a road to misery that they're that they're founding for themselves through through some of their activities, and so that it's this is a very challenging time. There's no question about it, and in the same regard, it's it's one of the most interesting times in history because, I mean, even just a few years ago, you couldn't have imagined. Uh, many of the things that are happening as we speak, like with the farmers in the Netherlands. I mean, you know, what's up with that? Why Why would somebody want to do something like that if they have any uh, heartfelt feelings towards mankind in general? You know, so that uh, uh, it's kind of tricky. And now with the, the, the supposed massive discovery of, of gold, in in uh, Africa, that's under the control of Chinese. Although we have to remember, of course, that it was a Chinese company that was attempting to use uh, copper uh, plated with gold as as uh, an asset to to uh, build. Uh, then you see that the, the world is not what it seems to be, and so what we try to do here is, is to gain our equilibrium by understanding that our the resolution of all these challenges, the ultimate resolution is through our re being able to receive what Christ has to offer the world. And of course, his only prayer that he gave to us is the Lord's Prayer, and it's his position in earth is described very succinctly in the first 14 verses of the Gospel of John. But that being said, uh, I think at this point I would like to, uh, let's see if I could find it even. <laughs> These things are challenging at times. I, I, I want to acknowledge uh, that this podcast has been made possible by the, by the generous support of Tyla and Vadim and Vivian and Neil and Christian and Mark and Maude and Druvman and Laura and Paula and Rick and Michael and Beth and Anil and Fred and Istar and Anna and so many others over the years. I want to thank you all for supporting our humble efforts. And uh, I, I like to do that a little early because I, I don't want to forget. And I really am uh, so grateful that these things help us continue on. But that being said, so when you get into some of these uh, uh, philosophical investigations of Wittgenstein, and, and, and it's interesting how he frames up with his student Bertrand Russell. You know, that's, that is an interesting thing, of, of, of which most people who are going to be watching this would have haven't a clue. But uh, I have a great respect for Wittgenstein because I think he's basically the philosophical endgame. And Rudolf Steiner, like I've said on numerous occasions, said that there was a time in, in the uh, early uh, history of Greece, ancient Greece, to where philosophy began with Thales, and, and that uh, 
likewise it has a culmination at which that worldview has has like a time stamp on it and and it's understanding what Rudolf Steiner had said that that the mystery of Pentecost was that Christ had given time back to mankind so that we wouldn't just resign ourselves to being beings of space. That's a riddle in and of itself, just to understand what the implications of that might be. But as you look at Rudolf Steiner's investigations into, into great spans of time, you see that it's this whole idea of metamorphosis within time that is the the crux of the matter. And and uh, if you look at it more closely, you see that uh, I have to find my reference here. Where did I put it? Oh, I guess I didn't leave it open. Well, you know, and it's something that uh, many people that uh, are of the Christian confession struggle with because uh, when Jesus Christ says, know ye not that ye are gods, uh, that that's troubling for a lot of people because what kind of thinking would it take to make that a possibility? And that's that whole concept that St. Paul presents of that uh, ye shall be as the angels. So that there is this whole idea of, of a destiny for mankind to, uh, that's an evolutionary destiny, an evolutionary goal. And that's what we keep returning to here. And that's the central grail mystery is the capacity to receive that you're working on your, your astral etheric and eventually you're physical to be able to take part in this transformation that has been brought to earth through the incarnation of Christ at the baptism in the River Jordan. And so uh, that is a very problematic for uh, many philosophers and scientists. I'm sure uh, Schopenhauer probably would have thrown a pie at me for saying that one, you know. So you have to have the necessary concepts that, that are uh, concepts of time. You can't solve that riddle just working with the concepts of space, which is the domain of most philosophers. They don't have a, a, a system that embraces the value of time. Uh, for the most, well, you know, Heidegger, yeah, he, he does give it a valuation, but it's, it's not developed. And even if you get into esoteric writers like René Guénon, uh, René Guénon, he's, you know, the, the uh, reign of quantity. It's as if it's just downhill all the way with him. And so you have a, a difficulty there, and that's embraced by many of the the traditionalists of that kind of pessimistic view of Kali Yuga, not understanding that there's a lesser Kali Yuga that ended in 1899. And so I guess what I want to say is, that, and it's clear to most people here, that I tend to uh, make Anthroposophy of Rudolf Steiner, that's the mothership for me. And and because it, it's the only worldview that I know of that gives me sufficient concepts to solve certain questions that I personally struggle with. Gosh, yeah, you're saying a lot today. Um, I like it sometimes when we don't entirely agree. Um, that's healthy and it's something that these young whippersnappers have forgotten how to do. Um, and you learn by debate. That's also something we've forgotten how to do. I think it's a little, a little grudging to minimize Heidegger to only having sort of a, a a vague grasp of it. I mean, I think he would have agreed with you that Western philosophy has come to its end. I don't agree with that. Um, you know, the, a philosopher can start from any point of empiricism, uh, from idealism. A, a philosopher can start from any point, therefore by definition can go on forever. But it doesn't mean it will make any sense you know, I'm quite proud to be, in my own humble way, a theologist because there's an agreed language and people may strongly disagree with me, but at least we all know what we're saying to each other. Uh, that's not really possible in philosophy. Um, but you can't help getting the feeling 
that philosophy as it's been done traditionally is really coming to an end. I mean, that certainly is what uh, sign und Zeit, John. Yeah, I remember uh, I saw an article in the newspaper years ago. It must have been 25, 30 years ago. And, and they were interviewing the head of the philosophy department at the University of Michigan, which is one of the uh, key hubs uh, beyond Silicon Valley for, for uh, the computer world. And uh, they were talking to this philosophy uh, department head, and they asked them to, they could share some insights as far as being head of the philosophy department. He said, well, philosophy has become so specialized, they all have proprietary languages. So I have uh, a group of professors that can't talk to each other. Oh, God, why does that depress me even more? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah I mean, the trouble is it is getting that way. And also what the Anglo-American school, so-called, is doing is now at such odds with the so-called continental school. I'm not even sure there can be a bridge between the two. Um, certainly Heidegger, as an example, as an exemplar of the continental school, but I mean, the whole of being and time is basically a lead up to theology, which he is is absolutely adamant uh, that it can't go any further. Um, well, I, I write theology. Why not? Um, but at the same time, you know, if you're coming from that background and that tradition, I suppose at least that's an honest answer. And I love the poetry of the book and I love the evocative nature of the book. And I think it's honest. But it's limited. It's honest, but it's limited. But my God, we need some more honest philosophy. And, and of course, Wittgenstein is the exemplar of the Anglo-American school, which has reduced, if that's the word I'm looking for, the whole of philosophy to linguistics. Um, then it's hard to see how that can progress beyond him. I agree with you there, too. I mean, certainly the Tractatus, to my mind, I mean, you know, what possible question is there left in terms of traditional philosophy of language that can now be discussed i mean he's answered it uh, which is why the philosophical investigations is so pregnant with meaning you know uh, one of those guys that writes two masterpieces very a very rare occurrence um and the philosophical investigations to my mind reopens philosophy but in a very narrow way I mean, if we're all playing language games, in other words, every group, every society, every culture uh, has its own type of discourse. And really, that type of discourse doesn't mean anything beyond that group. Then, right. So we can discuss that forever. We, you know, we can have the linguistics of it. We can have the historical linguistics, the sociolinguistics, the psycholinguistics and so on. But why? You know, there, there isn't a point, which is why the existentialist in Heidegger, in uh, forgive me, in Wittgenstein, interests me. You know, the fact he terrify his students to death by mentioning the fact that a chair existed and, and they were terrified. I mean, that good on him. You know, I mean, that, you know, do you know you exist as well? <gasps> you know, that, that, that is beyond linguistics. But for me, that's the beginning of theology, which also. Wittgenstein, for various reasons, actually more complicated than Heidegger, wouldn't venture into. I mean, he he felt he's got a strange attitude to religion. You know, that was the province of ministers, of pastors. Therefore, it wasn't really his, you know, the right domain for him. That's a very, that's not simply a generous view. That's a very, very articulate view of what can be done and what can't be done by his particular language game. So, yeah, I mean... Even if philosophy is coming to an end, I think you're looking at its rebirth in some form or other, and certainly you're looking at the regeneration of theology and theologisms uh, that are benefiting from all this type of discourse. I will just say one thing extra about modernism before I hand it back. Um, I mean, certainly I'm not the only one, <clears throat> there are lots of people who have had a distrust of modernism. You know, it's just too glib. It's just too perfect. It's just too, it's just too squeaky clean and easy. You know, the perfect nuclear family, all wearing sil silver undies and living on the moon. You know, lovely. But you know, is that really what life is all about? 
Um, and yet, you know, wonderful movies like uh, the, the original, not the Keanu Reeves remake, which was tosh. You know, The Day the Earth Stood Still. Uh, um, what was it? I can't remember the name of the actor. I know the name of that actor backwards, you know. And the robot Gort, you know, bringing order order to a, to a chaotic world. I mean, isn't that Michael Rennie? Isn't that wonderful? You know, he, and he stood on his flying saucer and he's giving the adieu to the woman that he's talked to for the last couple of weeks. Isn't that lovely? But, you know, what's behind that all? An unrepentant type of solar phallic interpretation, you know, that reason is the only, and not in the way the philosophers would have used the word reason, it's the only possible way of living in this world and doing anything about this world. And we are the masters of our own destiny, even if we have to destroy everything around us. That's when you've got to think, well, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. You know, don't we rely on those other things to survive ourselves? Um, the arrogance, I mean, it's you're right, our, our dear friend C.S. Lewis, what was that novel? Uh, that hideous strength, wasn't that it? With the brain that's in the rocket and the brain has lost all human empathies. It's lost all human sensibilities and it's simply, a you know, it uses the mechanisms around it to achieve its logical ends. I mean, that's the Nazi party. You know, I think they've got the nowadays scholars, if scholars is the word I'm looking for, uh, you know, they've got this romantic view of the Third Reich. And yet they're all listening to Wagner. Where? When? You know, and they're all running around dressed like Vikings. No, uh, what you're looking at is that this final sort of ruthless, cold codification of what's wrong with the nation state and what will correct that in the most ruthless, inhuman, you know, uh, desensitized terms imaginable. That's where all this leads, which is why I sort of applaud the early postmodernists because they realized there was something wrong. And I applaud the reaction that set in since then, not the craziness. But, you know, we need to reevaluate our values and think, heavens, if we go down that route, God Almighty only knows what will turn up next. Handing back, John. Well, you know, in getting back to this idea of the, of the modernists, I mean, you triggered another thing because uh, a couple of books that, that uh, Ford Maddox Ford co-wrote with uh, Joseph Conrad, who's uh, quite a significant uh, modernist and was one of the writers that was launched by uh, Ford Maddox Ford's uh, literary magazine. But uh, which is interesting because it brings us somewhat into the contemporary world. And you, and you think of the character of Colonel Kurtz played by Marlon Brando in Apocalypse Now, which was really a re-presentation uh, of the heart of, darkness, the heart of Darkness, the novella by uh, Joseph Conrad. But uh, Colonel Kurtz as Marlon Brando plays a renegade army special forces officer who's presumed insane and he's accused of uh, many things and so you get to the end of the uh, movie where he's back in his stronghold and he's reclining and he's talking on the world about the world and into a kind of a, a reverie but it, what, what interested me about that scene was the the books that were on the floor that that uh, Francis Ford Coppola had, had put near him. And I wonder, I've always wondered, uh, Francis Ford Coppola, what is that Ford in there? Is there some kind of tie into uh, Ford Maddox Ford, whose actual name wasn't Ford, but he had to change it. He wanted to change it from a German one because of the nature of the times. And But uh, if you get into looking at what books were there, they had Goethe's Faust, they had uh, the... Um, uh, what was it, T.S. Eliot, and then you also had uh, the, uh, was it, From Ritual to Romance by Jesse Weston, which is a, a study on the grail. And so you see this as, as kind of an imaging of, of Colonel Kurtz's like a, a Faustian-like figure. He's kind of a clingsore. He's, he's uh in the in the center of that heart of darkness, and so that's that whole image, like in this hideous strength, where you have this kind of brain bound, brown, 
brain, I can't even say it, brain bound materialism, that this, this, this uh, enthroning of this selfishness, of the, the Luciferic head forces, you know, that uh, is finally figured out you might as well just go for broke. And so, yes, we have that. It's, it's a tragic uh, kind of culmination of, of, of world, worldview, worlds in collision, so to speak. You know, it's like that there is this whole idea of what is going on between Venus and Earth. And uh, it led Velikovsky into all manner of speculation. But Venus, being that that ties into that whole domain of Lucifer is very much key because that's the phosphorus. That's that, that bright shining planet, right? And so you have this whole idea of the tutelary influence of the life of the senses that ties into uh, the mysteries of, of the world of the senses. And that's the mysteries of Dionysius the Younger, so to speak. And that, but the intellect that had to come into the world. But the challenge now is how are we going to take this intellect and be able to bring into it the elements of cosmic thought that the real key to understanding the, uh, this cosmic thought region is, is, has to do with the grail question that Parsifal, uh, the first time he went to the grail castle, he didn't think to ask, brother, what ails you? He didn't do that. Uh, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter. It's that it, the prominent feature of what he was doing didn't have to do with that love aspect that, that takes in the other. And, and to be able to bring that element, that is the key. That's the, the ultimate thing. And I think we're going to have to do an episode on karma just to give some concepts that are related to that. And usually about this point, I get in. Oh, I, don't, I have to go get them, though. I'll be right back. You go ahead. Well, I hate it when that happens. What am I, what am I meant to say now? Um, uh, yeah, I like some postmodernists. I like William Burroughs, if he counts as a postmodernist. <coughs> I certainly like the early postmodernists. And you always get the impression that, you know, you can invite them, unlike the modernists, you can invite them to dinner because you'll have good conversation and you'll have good company. And they'll know the good wines and they'll bring them round. And they will be able to, you know, enchant, enchant everyone around them. But at the end of the day, they leave the back door open for Nietzsche, who comes down and burns down the, you know, comes in and burns down the building. So um, I hand it back to you, John. Anyways, so I guess uh, we we've thrown some confetti on the on the the field of dreams here, and uh, that's all we ever tried to do. But that being said, I'm I'm very honored to have. As my co-host here, the uh, Reverend David William Perry, who is the author of The Grammar of Witchcraft, which is not a grammar, it's a Shakespearean study. And his Shakespearean as poetry, Caliban's Redemption. And Reverend David's grasp of language shows that uh, studying uh, literature is not a bad thing. And here's his major work, Mount Athos Inside Me, Essays on Religion, Swedenborg in the Arts. And that is edited by Daniela Hadi Induced, his partner and uh, co-editor. And uh, I, I restructured my room here, so I'm having trouble finding things. And I'm an author. Oh, uh, David's books are available on Amazon as are uh, Daniela Erendus. The links are below uh, for, for all of that. And so you could check it out. I hope you do. And for myself, The Arcana of the Grail Angel is my first book, some 640 pages, The Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity which flowed from the brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the True Rosicrucian Order, with a forward by my best buddy, Douglas Gabriel. And it has a great many diagrams that 
that were inherited from Aaron Fred Pfeiffer and their hand hand drawn diagrams from Aaron Fred Pfeiffer himself in color, by the way. And uh, here is some of the content. Plus, there's a great many more. There's more diagrams in this second book here, which is my second book, The Arcana of Light on the Path. And uh, this has a forward by the noted astrosopher and psychologist, the late William Bento. And both of these books can be uh, acquired through uh, eBay here in the continental US. If you're outside the US, you can always contact me through private message on Facebook or through the academia link below, and you can download a free PDF of the forward by William Bento on that academia link. And uh, if you want to buy us a cup of coffee uh, for Reverend David, it's paypal.me forward slash D Perry 777. And for myself, paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888. And uh, boy, that's a mouthful. Oh, click like and uh, please subscribe. And uh, thank you so much for showing up here. And so uh, we have a few minutes left. And as, as what's part of what's so wonderful about these conversations, is I never quite get a chance to get around to the things that I really was planning on talking about. So it becomes more off the cuff, as they say. But uh, I'm just glad to have somebody who can have something to say about some of the obscurities that I tend to bring to mind. I don't know if I meant to go into the prayer or not. You know, I have to nod. Um, I will say, I will say, I love Velikovsky. Um, I remember reading Worlds in Collisions as a as a teenage brat and feeling feeling myself as part of this mobile universe. Um, and I notice all of his critics haven't really said it can't happen. They don't like the time frame that he's using, but they've not said it can't happen. That needs to be pointed out a little more robustly um, because it's not happening in the way he's saying it doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, you know, the fact there are no fixed orbits, the fact the planets can move around in a lot more eccentric fashion than we allow them to, or maybe a much more complex fashion than we previously considered. Um, yeah, and that weird relationship between Earth and Venus, which seriously needs looking into at much more depth. <clears throat> um, John, <clears throat> I don't quite get around to the concept of pralaya and the whole idea that the uh, planetary condition comes in and out of uh, existence in different levels of being, right? which are essentially different states of consciousness, which goes back to where Hegel was headed with his whole ideas that, as Rudolf Steiner said, he was attempting to to come to terms with cosmic thought so you have these realms of being that are essentially the thoughts of spiritual beings but their capacity to be able to understand how there could be such a thing is is based upon their perception of their own nature and so there's a certain uh self-centeredness in, in worldviews that that they can't get past their description of themselves in attempting to describe the universe. So it's an interesting dilemma that they have put themselves and uh, in consequence of others. But the, let's not forget that Hegel was giving a lecture one time and when he got to the end of the lecture, he had very poor sight, as I've said before. And he walked out and he realized that there was nobody there. <laughs> well, he's himself to blame for being the ultimate professor. <laughs> And boring everyone to death. Um, I mean, let's face it, some of those pages are nearly incomprehensible. The ideas are sublime, but the way he puts it sometimes, you know, it's not true that Montague Summers, yes, I like Montague Summers, uh, isn't a good writer. He's a superlatively good writer. It's not true that he writes in a sort of staid, uh, old fashioned way. It's just beautiful and not to the modern taste. Whereas he Hegel actually does write in this incomprehensible way that it is stayed. I mean, you know, in philosophy, students used to read pages aloud to each other 
for a bit of a laugh before the tutor came in, um, which is a bit harsh, but understandable. Um, John. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I, I thought you're pointing at yourself. I thought, what no, 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 I've not gone that far. Thank you. <laughs> Anyways, you, you probably already read it, but I'm going to read it for those that are just listening. Uh, Lucifer, Old English for Lucifer or Satan. Also, Morning Star, Venus in the morning sky before sunrise, also an epithet or name of Diana from Latin, Lucifer or Morning Star. Uh, noun use of adjective. First of all, I uh, in spiritual science, we would draw a strong distinction between Lucifer and Satan. And uh, Rudolf Steiner goes to great lengths to, to show the distinctions of that. But it's, it's something that you can find in medieval writings. And I have found examples of the difference between Lucifer and Satan because the Lucifer, uh, like uh, the uh, Hebrew word, pertaining to that refers to being brazen and it has to do with reflected light rather than being the actual source of light of the of the Elohim Christ uh, outpouring shall we say and so it's it's very different and so you'd see like Satan would refer to like Araman the spirit of materials and Araman of course says, the spiritual stuff's all an illusion. Whereas Lucifer would say this material world is all illusion. So they're at odds in their worldview and they, they get us sucked into their little drama and we lose touch with the spirit of equilibrium and that's the Christ mystery. But I didn't mean to cut you off and I was trying to lead you up to uh, our weekly prayer. Um, yeah, I mean, it's all good stuff. I, I, I suspect there is much more of a division between those two words than people want to admit. Um, and it's comfortable of the church to, sadly, to conflate everything. Um, oh, no, I can't say that on the day that Calvin's o overpowering me. Um, let's, let's, right, let's do that. Uh, my friends, it's good to all be gathered here today in this other church, this little church, this community that we're building. It's a pleasure to meet my friend John and discourse with him again. Pleasure to be with you all, and I genuinely mean that. Um, you've got to remember that for the first two Sundays of the month, the first Sunday of the month is our, our service of worship at Valentine's Hall. The second Sunday, this Sunday, I've just spent an hour and a, an hour and a half preaching to the online Christian Persian Fellowship, so I'm not at my most fresh. And I'm being fried to death in an, a premature Indian summer. So bear that in mind. Um, what can I say? Um, some people look for purity and mystery, even within the deepest configurations of logic. And I think that's when faith and anthroposophy and Christianity itself begins. Let's hold each other in prayer until we meet again. Let's pray against the limitations that are forced upon us by those around us, often unintentionally, and remember our basic common source in the light and brilliance of Christ Jesus, our Saviour. God bless you all. Amen. Amen. And thank you so much. And everybody that's here, thank you. And for the people that see it later, thank you too. And uh, have a good week.